Uh, a couple months ago, uh, Jackie Lau called me and asked me if, um, if I'd ever, he ever heard of uh, Nadja Salerno Sonnenberg, and I said I had because I'm a classical music fan, and I knew that she was one of the girl's great violinists. And uh, so after some months of fundraising and other things, we, were, we managed to, um, uh, to acquire Nadja's services to come in and help with our string orchestra, and she's going to tell us about that tonight. But um, before that, she's going to play a song with Yui Asano, and um, it is a song by Rachmaninoff, and it's called Vocalese. Right. Welcome, Nadja Sonnenberg. Thank you. 
That was great. Thanks. John. You're welcome. <laughs> so you played that piece for a long time. When did you first play it? You know, uh, I think I was maybe 14 or 15. I heard it when I was a kid because I grew up in a, in a home that listened to opera a lot. So I had, like always, I was hearing singing in my house and everything. So I heard it, and then I, I played it when I was about 14 or 15 years old. But you know, I was so young, and I could never, nor should I have understood the meaning of that piece at that age. What makes it so difficult to play? The thing that, you know, you hear um, a slow piece, you know, maybe a slow song. <clears throat> And you think, or you hear like a, a, an instrumentalist playing something slow, and you think that that's easy because it's slow. But what makes it difficult is the control that you have to have. So um, the, the, everything that happens for a string player happens with this arm, not this. It looks like this is what he's doing all the work, but nothing, nothing is going to happen here if you don't. This is like the, the, the gas that makes the car run. So it, it's um, bow arm control, and, and, and the, the hardest thing is to take a long phrase and not and, you know, keep the tension going so that it's not um, just take the arc of the phrase. You know? It's just like in a conversation. If you, you, know, you can speak so intently that there's no way somebody is, is going to blink when you're looking at them like I'm doing right now to you, right? Because it's so intense, right? So, <laughs> So, but then I could be like, well, also, you know, I went to the store and then I, and then I, well, did I get the gas in the car? You know, and then you, your mind starts wandering, right? So, it, the hard thing about playing a slow song or this one is to, is to, to hold that line, that, that line, real, real long time. What role does breathing play in that? Huh? Breathing. Oh, you know, <clears throat> I'm not aware of my breathing when I play. Really? I'm not aware of my body when I play. Huh. Uh, which is probably why I look weird or faces or stuff like that. But uh, it's, um, I think that like when, when, when something becomes very intense, I think we naturally don't breathe until it's over, you know? A, a hard lick or some passage that's really tough to play. I, I'm, I'm never aware that I'm breathing when I'm playing, but I must be because, you know, I would die. <laughs> I've got to be breathing. <clears throat> so the instrument you're playing it's not really your instrument, right? This is my instrument. What, <laughs> what do you mean? It wasn't made for you. <laughs> no, it wasn't made. Um, so that, that instrument was made in? This instrument was made in the year 1721. And is, uh, the, the name of the maker is um, Peter Gornarius. And way, 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 way back then is when they made these incredible instruments. These are works of art. This is, this is you know, this isn't. But there are some, some instruments that are worth as much as the Mona Lisa. Because yeah, nobody knows what the secret is to the, how they made the varnish on these instruments. So this, this is a pretty expensive violin, and, uh, and it is mine. How long have you had it? I have had it for 15, 16 years now. And you have another instrument, too. I have another instrument, which is a modern violin, meaning that the maker made it in 1970s. And uh, it's a great fiddle, too. It's, uh, it just doesn't have the subtlety, doesn't have the warmth of sound it, you know, that, that this one does. I think it's the age. It's not, you know age of the wood also changes the sound. Does it make you play differently? Having a great instrument, having, a, having great tools to work with, if it's an instrument or whatever it is that you're working with, <clears throat> will improve your performance. But I think it's great to learn your craft on crap. That's, see if you know what I mean, because if you can, if you can, you know, drive a beat up old car, it's on its last leg, stick shift, it doesn't go in reverse, or it doesn't, doesn't have, you know, it, can, it doesn't turn left. You know, you just have to find a way to make that car work, and then you drive a Rolls Royce. I mean, so that's, I think that's what I mean. It was like when I was young, I played, you know, very, I couldn't afford anything, very, grew up kind of poor, so um, couldn't afford anything. So I just played, you know, pretty much the kind of violin that you would. Put in the fire for warmth, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's a viola, I think. <laughs> viola. <laughs> um. <laughs> and if it's really cold, you put a bass in there, and that, that's you know. Um, well, you were you were in at Curtis when you were eight. What was it like being a college student at eight years old? Yeah, Curtis Institute of Music in Philadelphia was, until I got there, primarily a college. So you know, your age. <laughs> I was eight years old, and I had just come from Italy, and I didn't speak English. 
Mm. And I was little. I was so little until I was about 14. I did not grow until I was about 14. So I was like a 12-year-old girl about that high. It was kind of sad. <clears throat> and I remember very distinctly, Curtis is um, one of the finest music schools in the country, but it used to be someone's home who donated it for, uh, it's like a huge brownstone, not nearly even as big as the homes on St. Charles, but a big brownstone, uh, nevertheless, in the middle of uh, Center City in Philadelphia, and they turned that into a school. So the door was enormous. I couldn't get into the school because I was little. I could not handle that door. It's a big bronze door. So I just waited outside till somebody came in or out and then just kind of <laughs> got in there. It was, um, and like I said, it was somebody's home. So that's what it looked like inside. Um, so, so they sort of made classrooms and this and that and a little hall here and there, but really it looked like someone's home. Like, you know. So I was young and, and very curious and kind of bad little girl and so you know, I got into all kinds of trouble. Uh, really Dennis the Menace kind of thing in, in that school. I used to hide out in the organ pipes um, <laughs> to cut class. They never, you know, and many, many, many years later, like, like about 15 years later, I shouldn't say this, 15 <laughs> years later, they, w they changed the organ pipes for, for, the, for the organ in, in the school. So they went up there, you know, and they had to take all those old pipes down and put new ones, and they found like 400 bags of Cheetos, <laughs> like <a> Cheeto <laughs> things that, for what I was <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to eat, right? Uh, yeah, you got to eat, right? <laughs> so you were there for a couple of years? I was at Curtis for, uh, from 8 to 14. 8 years old to 14, and then, I, uh, and then I went to Juilliard. Did you play that size violin? No, I was... Three uh, quarters? The, the, the violins come in lots of different sizes, the little teeny ones, and then a quarter, 16th quarter, uh, half, three quarters, and full. So... I was at that time on a, uh, I was, I think I was either the 16th or the half. Well, how did you get to the point of being so good that you were in that conservatory? I mean, you know, I was actually, um, like I said before, Curtis was a, only a college and all, only completely um, a scholarship. So there was no, if you got into that school, no um, tuition at all. Um, and my mother knew somebody who, had, who was on the staff there, and she didn't, we had just come from Italy. She didn't know where I should go to, to get a good violin teacher. She really didn't know. So she asked, you know, can you recommend somebody? He said, bring her in, and, and the violin faculty here will listen to her play, and we'll recommend somewhere for her to go. So that's what happened. I went in there. I played my little, little dinky little piece that I knew at eight years old. And instead of recommending a teacher I could go to, they took me on. And then they started a preparatory division. So that's, that's, that's how it started. And then the next year, a lot of little kids auditioned. Really? And then it became, you know, so I, I was like king of the roost because I knew all the nooks and crannies of the place, you know. <laughs> and then the next, the next year, there were like 12 little kids. And I was like, follow me, <laughs> follow me. I know what to do. <laughs> Did you play in the orchestra? Yes. Fantastic experience playing in orchestra. I love, I love playing in orchestra, especially being a soloist where you sit in front of the orchestra and you play your solo part and it. It's harder than anybody else's part, and it's all on you, kind of. And uh, so to be a member uh, of, like, it's just like you're in a team, and I love it. I, lo I still love it to this day. Um, but we, we were required to be an orchestra, and we also were required to learn piano. Um, and the pianists were required to be in choir. So you had to learn another, you had to learn something else besides what your major was. Do you play other instruments? I play the piano very badly, <coughs> and, I, uh, and I play the trumpet even worse. <laughs> I've heard that. Yes. I'm a famous bad trumpet player. <laughs> uh, she was on the Tonight Show, and you were, this was 30 years ago, right? Um, 25 years ago? So, yeah, 20, yeah. And so you, Johnny Carson was the host, and somehow... Do any of you know who Johnny Carson is? All right. All right. A couple of you know who he is. That's good. Well, if you check YouTube, you can see Nodge's performances on, on Tonight Show. And she played, you played... Um, what, what was the Bugler's other class? Holiday. Oh, on the violin you played that same night. I played the Swan. Oh, that's right. The Swan is a beautiful, gorgeous piece, kind of like the one you just heard. Just beautiful, beautiful piece. And uh, and then I played Bugler's Holiday. And the next on the thing trumpet. you know, you're yeah. playing the third part of the Bugler's yeah, Holiday. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that was good. It was brave. Yeah, I had. <coughs> I was nervy. So um, after you left Curtis, you went to Juilliard. Yeah. And you were there for throughout your college years. You yeah. Know? I had to drop out of Juilliard because I won an international competition called Naumburg. Uh, 
Nuremberg International Violent Competition. And I won that when I was 20 years old. <clears throat> Unusual. Oh, I think, I think to the, I'm not positive about this, but I think to, the, to this day I'm still the youngest winner. Whatever that means, nothing. But it's a big international prize. Huh? It's the top prize in the, in the it's volume. It's a very big prize. You get, you get some money. Now you get more money. Um, I wish I, I should enter now. Uh, you get, you got, I got a nice piece of change. And, but really what you got was a recording, one recording deal, and then you got a bunch of concerts, including a debut at Carnegie Hall, a debut with Chicago Symphony Orchestra. You know, and as a classical artist, this doesn't get any bigger. I mean, you know, I mean, you, you, you don't have to be a classical artist to know Carnegie Hall, right? You know Carnegie. So that all came with, with winning the prize. And because I had to fulfill those obligations, I was falling behind a lot in school. I went back to school after I won Nuremberg, but I just couldn't keep up. It's not like I was a great student anyway. So you've been, be since honest. that time, you've been flying around playing concerti with famous orchestras. Yeah, concertos with orchestras all over the world and also recitals, which is like me and a pianist, like I just played with Yui just doing recital for two hours and just basically living out of hotels, yeah. So you did that for years. You don't do it quite Decades. so much anymore. Oh, really? Decades. I still do. Constantly on the road. Yeah, it's a little bit less now because, because I, I want to do this. I want to be here. I want to be, I wanna be not working with, with students. I want to be working with young people. I want to spread the wealth. So but this is the first university you've come to as a resident artist, right? right. For a period of time. So why here? Um, my love for this city goes back a really, really long way. And I, when I realized that I got to the point in my life after playing and performing so, so many years, and so I, can't, I couldn't possibly tell you how many thousands of concerts I've given. I, couldn't, I just couldn't even uh, figure it out. Even if I tried, I couldn't figure it out. It's just too many. Um, so you know, the, the arc of my career took me to this place where I just want to be working with, with, with students and, and young people. and, and, and it's not even so much teaching them, but uh, sharing what I know. And just, um, so because I was feeling that so strongly, I, I was just thinking to myself, where, if you're gonna do this, and I could do it anywhere in the world, anywhere in the That's world, true, where could. do you wanna do this? And I thought, I love New Orleans. I wanna, I, wanna, I wanna go to New Orleans. And then I was thinking, okay, now where in New Orleans? And um, then I knew a little something about this school, but then re researched it and, um, and really, the more I learned about Loyola, the more I loved it, because I just, the, the work ethic here, this is a beautiful, beautiful place. I'm so happy to be here, and thank you for having me. This is a good school. Uh, and you also like jello shots. Right? I like jello shots, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> what kind of a segue was that? You're in the right place. I was just talking about the work ethic at Loyola. <laughs> And now we're on Bourbon Street. But you know, you didn't talk about this chamber orchestra and what you're trying to do with that group. And also your, your own group, you have your own orchestra in San Francisco, the New Century Chamber Orchestra. Yeah. So tell them the point of that and what you're trying to do with our orchestra as a consequence. The point of what I'm trying to do is to, is to, is to develop a conductorless orchestra, a conductorless chamber orchestra. If any of you have ever gone to a concert or even seen a symphonic concert on YouTube or anything like that, you will see a bunch of musicians on stage, and then the conductor comes out, and then he stands in front of the orchestra and he conducts, right? That's, that's, that's standard, that's, that, that's wonderful. But if you don't have that conductor there, how do you imagine those musicians are gonna play? How can you imagine that those musicians are gonna, it's, you know, it's gonna be like a traffic jam it, it, or, or a train wreck. How are those musicians gonna play without the leader in the front showing them the way. The fact is that they can play, and sometimes, and mo very often, most often, they play better. And the reason is because those kids, those people are, their ears are so much more attuned to what's going on. Their focus is so much stronger because they don't have that crutch. They don't have that safety net. They don't have that guy up there or that girl up there. They don't have that. So what do they have? If you don't have that, what have you got? You've got you, you've got the person across from you, you've got the person behind you, guy next to you. That's what you've got. So you have to communicate with those people it's just like any like it's just like a jazz combo. I mean, you you know, exactly. it, it, there's no <coughs> leader really, right? So, but for for classical musicians, it's 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 much it's really hard. But if you can get people, if you get their ears trained to to that degree, where they know what's going on clear across the stage while they're playing, then that's fantastic. And then you're talking about creating a, like a super musician, like we're talking the Avengers super musician, you know. <laughs> Well, you, 
So in your orchestra, I've watched your DVD a couple of times, and it seems like everybody is having so much fun. You don't usually see classical musicians smiling and, and laughing while they're playing music. And, but in your orchestra, they do that. They seem to be completely alive and plugged in. Is that working here? Do you find that the transition is happening? I, think the ki I, th I hope the kids are having a good time. I, I love them. I really like love them like my children. And I, and I sort of, because uh, now I'm working with them a little bit and uh, sort of getting to know their personalities. And uh, I think that I, um, just because this music was written 300 years ago, doesn't, just because this violin was made that, that long ago, doesn't mean it shouldn't be played today or, or, or it can't be played. Or, you know, just because it was written a long time ago doesn't make it dead. Because music is, is, a, is, is a moving forward, a, not a static art form, you know? So I can play music from a long time ago, but bring it to life. And we can have fun doing it. Um, because there's nothing more fun than people playing together, you know? For making music together, no matter what kind of music it is. If it works, if you prepare, you learn your part, whatever it is, and you're not messing it up, but you're adding to the experience, then what's better than that? And if you get paid for it, whoo, touchdown. <laughs> touchdown, man. So um, this is the physical proposition. You're kind of an athlete in the sense of the, the, the physical exertion from playing music. And you can get injured doing that. You can get injured by repetition and also trauma. And you've had both. Yeah. So tell them the fascinating mm. story of the trauma. You mean the finger? Mm. Well, you know, I will just say that you can look at a violinist player or a cellist player or any trumpet player and you think, okay, that's, you know, that's not really hard on the body. But it, it, it actually is. And, and if you play an instrument, you should be aware that you're young now, nothing's going to affect you. You really are Superman now. But, but uh, stretching, just like an athlete would stretch, uh, if you have warm-up exercises, do them because later on in your life, They'll come back and haunt you. I mean, I have had some really severe tendonitis problems in my elbows, both elbows, for years now. It's really hard for me to, uh, to. It's just overuse and and not enough, uh, not being smart enough about my muscles. You know, playing. There's nothing more awkward or unnatural than this instrument. I mean, first place, you see that I'm holding it with my neck and not my hand. Um, I used to make money doing this when I was a kid. I would bet people, how long do you think I can hold this under my neck without? And they would say, okay, 20 minutes, and then somebody would say, 40 minutes, and then they would say, but I bet you you can't do that, and go over there and take that book off the shelf, and you know, all kinds, <laughs> so I'd be doing all kinds of vacuuming and everything, the violin here, just to make a couple dollars. But you see that I have to hold it with my neck. So this is gonna be really, you see the shoulder comes up, and then you do this for 35 years and see if that doesn't affect your, your neck and your back and um, it's, it's an unnatural instrument also. Like if you look at like cello, it's here. And that's not really that, you know, but here then you have to, this arm turns all the way around like this. Look at this. I mean, who invented this? <laughs> it's really unnatural. But um, so I, I, you know, I would really say do, stretch and warm up and do stuff like that. On Christmas Day 1994, I had a bad accident. I was at my, in my home and I had a lot of people over. I was making Christmas meal. And um, I was going too fast. I was in the kitchen. People were scattered around the place. And I was going too fast. I just was moving too fast. I was trying to get everything ready. I was slicing these onions. And I sliced my finger off. I sliced, uh, sliced the tip of, my, of this finger off, <coughs> my left finger. And so that yeah. is like not a good thing to happen. But if you are a violinist and, at, and, and a famous one, <laughs> that that's like <laughs> that was the end of that just like that in one second and so um so your life changed in, in a second it was even less than a second uh, thankfully the knife was very 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 sharp i'm told later that was a really good thing that the knife was so sharp uh so the, it was just clean off less than less than like that long that's how long it took just boom, that my life thing. changed yeah well, you've got to have that. Yeah, yeah, because we only have four fingers to play all those notes. So now one of them was taken away. So uh, yeah, it was a very, it was a very scary time for me, but um, a good time. I learned a lot, especially retrospect. You know, when you look back, the lessons learned are amazing. Well, you solved a ridiculous problem, but how did you solve it? Well, I was impatient. First place, you know, the whole day was amazing because it had to be reattached, and then it was Christmas Day, and so everybody working in the emergency room were like interns. 
And my friends who brought me to the hospital were like, no, 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 you're not putting her finger back on. You just, you know. So. It's New York City. New York City, yeah. So uh, anyway, uh, uh, we, uh, a plastic surgeon flew in, a helicopter he flew in, and he, and, he, and he reattached my finger. So, but still, it, it needed many, 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 many months for it to heal. And uh, so I couldn't play. And then I, uh, I got panicky, so I started to play, which was really stupid. I started to play with uh, three fingers. To, 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 I, I, I just had to start playing concerts again. I mean, mostly I had to start playing concerts again financially. I had to, you know. So I was stretching this one out all the way to here and pulling my tendon and just everything was, I just had to learn patience. It forced me to, to, to learn patience. And then it also forced me how to take care of yourself so that you have longevity. So you're not a flash in the pan. So oh, she had the most amazing career from 1996 to 1998. She was, she really, she really, you know, raised the roof, but then what? <clears throat> so I'm sort of like Madonna. I keep reinventing myself. I mean, I'm, I'm really very old. I'm, I'm, maybe you can guess my age, but I'll bet you anything that I'm older than you think I am. And I'm still like, you know, it's cool. <laughs> it's cool. <laughs> so I learned how to take care of myself better, you know, not to just. How long did it take you to get it back so you could use it? Really completely healed 17 months. Really long time. Did it change your playing after the fact? No, not at all. Uh, it only changed my appreciation for playing. I got, I was, at the time of the accident, I was playing constantly, too much, too much, too much, every night. If I wasn't on stage, I was in an airport. If I wasn't in an airport, I was in an interview. If I wasn't in an interview, I was on stage. I mean, it was just like, uh, and I was tired. And, um, and then th this happened, and so I was forced not to play. And what, what happened was that I, I missed playing. And that, that, that's the thing I learned. It was like, I really like to play. And I'm not going to let the business take that away from me. You know, and I, I, I've always liked to play. I, I love making music. It's fun. But the business was kind of sapping me dry. And so I learned how to balance that. I, I, I'm still learning. It's, it's a hard lesson. Well, how do you conduct your business? Do you have management? You have yeah, agents? I have management. Those, those people take 20% of <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> They, they have the nerve, they go, you know, you take 80% of my fee. I said, well, really? <laughs> uh, yes, I have a management. What they do is they book the concerts. Uh, they take care, they make the calls and they book the concerts. And, um, and then they take care of details, like what, what pieces am I gonna play in that concert? What, what date am I gonna be there? What hotel am I gonna stay at? And the, the flight that I'm gonna, and stuff like that. And am I gonna go to the reception and blah, 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 interviews. Everything that could happen in that town they take care of that. And then they get a 20% commission of whatever the fee is. But then a lot of artists, including myself, have um, publicists. So I was, I was very lucky when I was young, you know, I kind of, I became very famous in, in circles that were outside of classical music because of shows like Sesame Street, because of Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, because I was on 60 Minutes, because I was, you know, I, I even did Dharma and Greg. Anybody remember that show? I mean, it, so it was like, I was constantly, I had really incredible exposure. So, um, so I needed a publicist to, to handle the image and everything like that. So then there's that expense, you know. What about the recording deal? You, you, you don't have a recording deal right now. You, you record your own stuff. I right? have my own label now. Yeah. So what, how often do you release product? Do you release records? How, what? How often do you release records? Well, you know, right now it's at my leisure because it's my company. So I don't. It, I, I originally signed a ten-year contract with Angel EMI, which is the 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 cap, uh, capital was the mother of that. And um, so I I had a a, a ten-year contract, no, ten-album contract, or five years, whatever came first. So I, I con contracted to make ten albums for them. And in a way, it's wonderful because you're you know you're you're their artist, and you know you're gonna make those albums, but in another way, it's not good because you can't work with people that don't record for EMI. So it's like this family, it's like the old Hollywood system. You couldn't yeah. make a movie for Paramount if you were an MGM artist, right. right? So in a way, you're sort of protected and it's wonderful, and in another way, it's kind of constricting. But then in my business, in classical, the, the recording industry just went like, mm -hmm. what happened? It just yeah. went away, just right. went away. So that, I started my own label, and um, I'm doing quite well with it. You have a, a repertoire that you play when you go out. Are there favorite things that you just love to play? 
No, I, I mean, I, I have, um, I play a lot of different kind of music. I didn't always used to. I'm just trained as a soloist, a classical violinist, play stuff like you just heard. But then later on, I, I wanted to, I don't like being, you know, I just don't like when there are things that are blocking my way. I just, I don't like traffic. I don't like little rooms. You know, I just don't like, if there's no freedom for me, like if I don't see, oh, I can go here or here, then I start to get a little panicky. So um, I wanted to play different kinds of music and I wanted to work with different ty types of people. So I started doing that. I mean, I did, I did an album with Joe Jackson and then I started working with the Assad brothers. I started playing, I tried to play jazz, you know, but just, I wanted to branch out and, and just, take it all in instead of playing the same stuff, the same pieces over and over and over again. So I did that and you know that was like amazing because I would go out and play two week tour of Brazilian music and then come back and play the most strictly classical concerto you can imagine. It kept everything fresh, it was good. So um, <clears throat> uh, the, you, you don't play jazz, but you don't improvise, right? No, I, I mean, you know, if I, I think if I, took a year and devoted myself, because I love it so much, I have such great respect for a great jazz artist. Oh. Um, I think I would be able to do it badly. Well, we'd be happy <laughs> to If I took you. a year, I'd be bad at it, yeah. <clears throat> uh, I don't think it would be that bad, but we'll see about uh, that. Uh, we have a lot of jazz players in this room, I think they could help well, you Well, like out. for example, when I play Gershwin, who is, Right on the borderline, well, he's a classical composer, but he's also written, you know, Summertime. Embraceable You is not considered a classical no. song, right? So, uh, so when I play Gershwin, then I go, oh, I mean, it's so great for me because it's written out, but it's a completely different style, which I'm very comfortable in, you know? So I, I don't play Gershwin like a classical artist, which is fun. Well, what do you, what's on your iPod? What do you listen to? Um, I don't have an iPod. You have an iPod? I don't have an iPod. Do you not listen to music? I do listen to music, but I, I don't listen to it like that. You know, I'm older, I'm another generation, and um, I actually put, like, there, uh, there's this thing called a CD, and you put it into the machine, and you press it, and then there are speakers, and you just sit there, and you listen to it like this. It's so great. <laughs> I don't like those things you put in your ears. I hate those things. Yeah, that's a little tricky. Um, <clears throat> it's not that it's tricky. Don't insult me, jeez. <laughs> well, they sound like crap. <laughs> um, so um, tell us about the concert on, on, what are you playing on Saturday night? Okay, so Saturday I'm, I'm working with the chamber orchestra. We're, we're performing and we put together a good program because it's varied. So there are two pieces by Bach. Uh, one is Brandenburg Concerto, which is just really a great piece for strings to play. Because everybody's got, you know, it just goes all over the place. There's this, and these people are playing, and this people, and that. It's just trade back and forth. It's like the coolest jazz coming all together. And then we're doing Bach Double Violin Concerto, which means there are two violin soloists. I'm, the, the, I'm a soloist, and then there are three different violinists from, from the orchestra that are playing with me for each of the movements, which is cool, because, like, everybody gets to play solo. Yeah, yeah. So that's really great. Then we're playing this piece by Grieg called the Holberg Suite, and that is a, a wonderful piece because it's romantic and it's exciting and it's it's kind of like a pirate music, you know, a lot a lot of the time. And it's very very rare, and it's going to show the orchestra off because there's stuff that's really hard and really fast, and then there's this big sound that the orchestra has to create, and and then there's romantic. So it's a really great piece for that. And then I'll play a little solo number with them for an encore. Oh. It's going to be a really good program. And by the Even way, nobody's coming. free to students. So please come to the conference. Free to students plus you get a dollar. <laughs> Don't forget. So anybody have any questions for Nadja? Yes, sir. The mic should be on up in here. So let's see if, it's, if you speak up, you might hear it. Uh, as a classical musician, um, my biggest issue is not putting, like not being able to put my own character into the music, like being always being told you have to do this and this and this is how the composer would want it. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with putting your own touch into each? each it's, a, it's a matter of balance. And by the way, most of the composers you're writing are dead. I mean, you're playing are dead. So when somebody says that's the way the composer wanted it, you just have to look at them and go, really? You were like there when he wrote this piece? <laughs> <laughs> so there's that, there's that. 
It was just that. <laughs> but it's a balance thing, too. You know, okay, so you're playing this piece, and you gotta play the notes. You have to play what's on the page. You gotta respect the page. Like, like an actor has to respect the script. You gotta respect the page. And if there's something written like, you know, an accelerando or, you know, a crescendo to a forte, okay. But there are like a hundred ways of doing that. That's, that's what I'm saying. That's where the interpretive freedom comes in. That there's, there's so many ways of doing what's on the page that, um, and, and, and hopefully whatever ideas you have, as long as you have that respect for what's on the page, you see it, you've learned it, uh, now you gotta make it your own. As long, I hope that you're not stifled in that, in that attempt because, um, but, but, but I have to stress, you gotta respect the page. And once, once you've done that, there's no possible way that any composer dead or alive. There is no possible way that any creator can dictate exactly how you should play something or exactly how they want. You cannot possibly write that in the score or in the piece of music or in the creation. That It's impossible. You've got to leave some freedom to whoever is, is going to perform it. You have to leave that artist be and let them, let them do what, what's instinctively inside of them. But respect the page. <coughs> you ever had stage fright? I... I get nervous. I don't know if I, I don't know if I'd call it stage fright, but I get nervous, and I get really pissed off when I get nervous. <laughs> I don't like it. Uh, Why? Be because it, it interferes with the, the work that I've done. It gets in the way of it's like you go see this movie and you, you work you, oh, you can't wait for this movie. Your premiere, Star Wars is coming out January. Star Wars, I got the ticket, I can't wait. Midnight show, you, you're so happy, you saved up the money, you're sitting there and like this behemoth guy sits in front of you and you can't see the movie. That's what I think about stage fright and nerves. Like, how dare you? <laughs> Get the hell out of the way. You know, I practice and I'm ready and I, and I, wanna, I wanna play this piece and then comes this nerve thing that makes you feel like you can't. And I, 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 didn't, I don't like that. So you defeat I it with like anger? That. Anger? Anger for me has worked and I'm not gonna mess with it because I'm, I'm old and it's still working. So I'm not messing with that, no, with works. that no, theory. Just, I just, yeah, I get angry. It's like, <laughs> get out of here. So you don't really have, you, you don't, this never gets in your way. It has. And that's why, and I thought, I mean, my walk off stage so frustrated because I'm thinking, that's not how I play. That's not a representation of how I play. I barely got through that piece. My bow was all shaky and playing out of tune. I was rushing. I mean, I, that's not the way I play. And what, why, what the hell did I work so hard for? If it was going to come out sounding like that, I could have just slacked off. So I, 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 I just felt like the, the next time it happened, I felt it coming on. You feel it in your stomach. I couldn't swallow. You just feel the nerves. And I just said, I got so mad. I got so mad. And then I just walked on stage and, you know, kind of planted my feet. And I played really well. And I thought, aha, that's how you, that's it. I got the secret. Yeah. That's good. That's how I did it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Paul? Uh, so I'm producing a record with, a, with the chamber group. And it's the first time I've ever collaborated with, a, with the classical people. And, you know, it's so much, it's so different from the world of jazz or rock. And, uh, and so I was sitting at one of their rehearsals, and and it wasn't fun. You know? <laughs> they were they were really grinding at the music, and really it was just a totally different experience. So, um, what's it like preparing chamber music? Why can't it be more fun? <laughs> yeah, I mean, like what, what's the difference? Um, I don't know where to go with this question. Uh, I think one is enough from you. There's clearly not, not as much freedom in playing classical music as there is in jazz. I mean, jazz doesn't exist without the freedom. So you have the exposition of the tune. Okay, what, what's the tune you're playing? Whatever, whatever the tune is, and here you go. There's the tune, we heard the tune. Now, what? That is jazz. But classical music is different because we've got notes written from the very first page to the last page, and we've got to play those notes. Um, and, and, and so, like, you know, we were talking about before, there's like, might feel like it's a little stringent. But the beauty is if, you can, if you're well prepared and you feel comfortable playing those notes, then, then you can have a lot of freedom with those notes on the page. Um, I mean, that's how I've played my whole life. So it's never not fun when I play, even if it's really, really hard. 
And so maybe, I don't know what to say, I mean, maybe, maybe they're um, not prepared enough, maybe they're scared because they're not prepared enough, and so, geez, I wish I practiced this, I wish I was a little more prepared for this. But, um, <clears throat> you know, a reminder, are you producing this? So, um, you know, to, you can use your words, talk to them, <laughs> to use your words. Uh, ask them why, what, uh, you know, uh, what, what's, what's the deal? Why are, are you, you know, are you unhappy? Are you nervous? Are you not prepared? Let's have some fun. Um, and maybe, you know, just put it out there. It doesn't sound like you're having any fun. Mm. And unless the piece is like a funeral march where, may, you know, maybe you shouldn't be having too much fun, <laughs> uh, you know, maybe it'll make a difference. You know, there's no, just because it's classical music that shouldn't, should make it fun. You, if you come to see us play on Saturday, you'll see what I'm talking about. <laughs> Me and my kids are going to have a good time. <laughs> all right, so my next question <laughs> <laughs> look, at, look at all these other people, look at all these other kids want to ask a question. And look at him, he's like, oh, he's sitting there like this. Can you make your violin? Na, 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 na. <laughs> <laughs> David. Uh, do you also compose your own music? I don't. Not at all. Like, there's the answer. No. No. Wish I could. No. Uh, being so good early on, the amount of success you had uh, in your life, did you ever hit a peak? And if you did, how did you get past it? You know, uh, there are different peaks. When I was in my 20s and I was out there playing, it was so exciting for me, like in the dressing room. I had my dressing room, and then I, and I would hear, five minutes, Miss Larson, okay, oh, it's my turn. And uh, you're right, be, right backstage. They open that door, and this breeze hits you, and you're like, Ooh. and then you're on stage. And so this was amazing to me. But like after the 5,000th performance, that's not this. This becomes like, and I'm like, shut up. <laughs> I'm playing solitaire in here, you know. But there, there are different peaks. So there's a peak of excitement when you're young and, and you're just going out there. And you're, and, you're, and you're playing your stuff and you, you have success, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. You have that for a long time. Then for me, the peak was like, the, I got like working with other people and then getting really good at that and peaking at that. And then, you know, now, like my playing is so strong now. The way that I play this instrument is so strong because I've been doing it for so long and yet what I've been doing my whole life is not really that interesting to me anymore, even though I'm playing better now than I ever have. Because I, I want to be doing what I'm doing here. That's what interests me, and that's what that's where my passion is. So it, there are different kinds of peaks, you know. I mean, I can play this instrument better now than ever, but I I want to do I want to do other things. So they're just different different phases. Sir. Yeah. Um, so when you listen to other classical pieces in the orchestra. Um, are you able to hear the piece as a whole, or do you mostly your ears just tune in on what the violin is doing and kind of more in like a critical fashion? Well, I can hear it all because I am just that talented <laughs> <laughs> and old. I hear everything. That's, that's, that's another thing about what I'm, I mean, I hear, well, of course, what the violins are doing, but I also hear what the oboe's doing. I hear the, the piece in, in, in the whole. I hear the little small section I hear. I, you, I mean, my ears are so incredibly well trained, but because I've been doing it for so, so long. And that's what I'm trying to teach the kids here also, to train their ears to hear not just the part that they're playing, whatever's in front of them, but to hear how it works and fits with people across the stage. Um, it's really a, a wonderful, if you have good ears, boy, there's nothing can stop you. If, if you're a musician. You know, if you want to be a doctor, I guess that's not so important. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, um, as a classical composer who writes for the violin but doesn't play the violin, how do I go about making my works more idiomatic of the instrument? Don't write fits. Don't write a lot of fits. Yeah. We hate them. Okay. Uh, um, Why? Because the violin fingerboard is not a guitar fingerboard. The violin fingerboard is curved. It curves. All all string instruments except for guitar are curved. Is there, there's a curve to it. So you see guitarists go like this, you know, there, and then they play, 
you know, it's all, it's, it's right there, it's right there, but, but the, the, the fingerboard, this black part here that they're playing on, is flat, so that's gonna be in tune. But for a violinist, you have, in, in order to play that in tune, literally your finger on this string has to be different than where it is on this string. And so it's kind of like, you know, it just doesn't work. Um, that kind of writing works for guitar. Um, I mean, the best way to learn how to write for an instrument is to kind of mess around with it yourself. But that's really hard to do. If you have no string training, you just can't pick up a violin and play it, or a cello, or any, any really, you can, it's hard. So ask, ask, if you know somebody, ask somebody. I mean, literally, before you put that down on, and, and, and print it, ask a friend of yours who plays the violin, <coughs> It, can you, it, not so much can you play this, but is it playable? And then what is the level of difficulty? You know, because now when people write p pieces for me, they ask me also, is this, is this okay? And I know that it's okay, but I say, no, it's too hard. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. But I'm <laughs> so we really, one more question. It well, a lot of the pieces that we call it standard rep, standard repertoire, I learned when I was young, when I was a student. And then, you know, throughout, throughout my life. So those pieces, like I know them. If I'm gonna be contracted to go play the Brahms Violin Concerto in uh, Atlanta, then I know the Brahms. But I still have to practice it and get it back into shape, get it in my fingers. You, that's, you know, you never, you never stop practicing. You never stop practicing. But if it's a brand new work, well, then I need time to learn that. And also, it, it, in, in, in contemporary work, the really, really important thing is there's no reference. So if I have to learn the Brahms Violin Concerto now, there are like 400 recordings of it. And I can listen to it, and, and I grew up listening to that piece, because I'm a violinist and it's a standard rep violin concerto, so I, I knew how it went. Uh, but a brand new work, there's no reference, there's nothing to listen to. So you, the first par person playing that work, are, are the representative of that work from that moment on, for the rest of time. That performance is the, 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 the standard of which every other performance is going to be held. And that's a big responsibility for premiering new works. Sorry? Yeah, lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. <laughs> Can you play one other song for us? Play yeah, I'll play, I'll play a little Gershwin, a quick, a fast one. Play a little fast one for That'd you. That'd be okay? great. All right. Not just going to play for you. Now this is not, this I was talking about Gershwin before, this is not strictly classical, this, this particular tune is not strictly classical, and I'm sure even if you're not a musician, you'll be able to tell the difference in the style, the style of music from what I played before and what this is going to be. Okay. 